Well, I'll tell you a little bit about our guest, James Fox. He was born in England, good man, and raised in America by his father, Charles Fox, who wrote for newspapers and magazines like Rolling Stone, Playboy, Harper's and the Catholic Digest. And when James was just three years old, his father was struck with multiple sclerosis. For many years, James assisted his father as he traveled to locations for new stories. And they conducted interviews with people ranging from theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking for Esquire to race car driver Dan Gurney for Car and Driver. Now, for nearly 20 years, James has traveled across the world in pursuit of the truth about UFOs. <laughs> are you are you with us there, James? I am. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. I was just I was I was just going through an introduction, James, telling everybody about your experience. Now, before I ask you some questions, I wanted to just say to our listeners that you've produced three films about UFOs, and in 2007 orchestrated an event with help from journalist Leslie Keane from the Coalition for Freedom of Information, which is hailed as the most credible civilian effort of disclosure on UFOs in history. And I'm very excited because although I wasn't meant to be interviewing you this evening, uh, Bobby was, I'm excited to have this opportunity because I remember watching that, uh, that event and being fascinated by the, the credibility, uh, the, the, the evidence from these people that were involved in that announcement. So, James, welcome to the show. My first question for you has to be, when did you first become interested in UFOs? Well, thank you for that spectacular introduction. I need to meet this guy. He sounds amazing. <laughs> you're it. <laughs> if you're British, you're, you're good here, James. We, well, I think you're fabulous. <laughs> No, I do appreciate that. It's nice that someone's listening. <laughs> but but um, I was, funny enough, I had a father who was very mainstream. He worked for everything from Sports Illustrated, Playboy, Car and Driver, um, some tech magazines. We met with Stephen Hawking at Gainville, Gondol and Keys, and race car drivers. And I, funny enough, had a little bit of a sighting. Now... My sighting doesn't had anything to do with my current views on the subject matter. However, it certainly triggered an interest. And um, I found that the further I dug, the more I found. The more I found, the further I wanted to keep digging. And what I soon discovered was that there was a lot more to UFOs than swamp gas and weather balloons. Um, my father was extremely concerned about the path I was taking. He kept saying, look, son, there's nothing to it. It's a big waste of time. Whatever you do, please don't go down this path. It's a, it's a dead-end street. And I think that fueled me even further. I'll prove him wrong, you know, sort of thing. And uh, four years later, I produced and sold a film called UFOs, 50 Years of Denial, back in 1997. Wow, and... What was the reaction to that, James? Well, you know, it's a good little film. I mean, by today's standards, it doesn't really, I don't know, I stand the test of time. I, but overall, you know, we had, a, we had an astronaut. We had some high-ranking military officers. Uh, and, and I think people were, were stunned. Uh, we're, we're certainly impressed. Um, and the fact that I did it, I think, really surprised more people than anything else. And it... It, um, I never had any intentions on doing any further UFO related stuff after completion of that film. I mean, you know, four years on a project really takes the wind out of yourselves. And, um, we could get into this further, but basically through a series of invitations and just complete off the wall, uh, events, I was led into producing out of the blue. And how was the reaction to that? Uh, that was, uh, well, funny because I took my father during production of Out of the Blue to an interview with a gentleman named Gordon Cooper. He was a Mercury astronaut, one of the last American astronauts to go up in space alone. And he was an iconic figure of my dad's generation. And after that interview, 
my father was pretty much convinced that I was on the right path. Because he said to himself, why on earth would this man with everything to lose and nothing to gain, not asking for any money or any financial, uh, you know, gain at all, do this? Why would he talk about these very unambiguous encounters? And some of which dealt with evidence and the disappearance of evidence, some very good evidence, might I add. So uh, my father was on my team from that moment onward. Well, that's fantastic, James. James, I have to ask you, of all the people you must have interviewed and worked with in the production of these films, who would you say is the most credible source confirming that US UFOs do exist? That's a very good question. And I have two answers to that question. One would be my personal. Like, you know, there are times during your journey where you you have an affirmation that's just so palpable that you it's just it's very it very it deeply affects you. And I would have to say for that person my personal view, now this wouldn't be necessarily shared among the UFO community or perhaps anybody else. But there was a meeting with a gentleman in Texas in 2008 named Ricky Sorrells. He was a deer hunter. And he was a very religious man. His family was religious. And he had this experience that, quite, that forced him to question the very nature of his religion. Where he stood under this craft. He said it was so quiet he wouldn't have known it was there had he not looked up. And he looked up with his rifle in hand, and it was dusk. And he's a metal worker. And he looked up and he saw this object so large that he couldn't see the edge in any direction. And he could study the metal. It was just above the treetops. And he looked at the metal and he was trying to describe the metal, unlike anything he'd ever seen before. No rivets, no seams, no weld marks. And he was trying, to, he was looking at the belly of this, air, of this craft that was silently hovering just above him. And he, at one point, took his rifle and looked through the scope and aimed it at it and was actually considering pulling the trigger just to see what sort of, how he would, if it would ping off the metal or what it would do. And then he thought to himself, perhaps this isn't such a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't. But meeting with this man because he didn't want to go on camera. He didn't want to go public with what he'd experienced. He was having a really difficult time with it, with his religion. He was having a really difficult time with it, with his family. And um, he wished the whole experience had never happened, but it did. And it took me three months to finally get him comfortable enough to go on camera. And that, for me, speaks volumes because he's not looking for publicity. He's not looking for any financial rewards. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. And when you meet with people like that, you know, and the thing is with UFOs, a lot of times people always associate some sort of ambiguous light off in the distance that could be interpreted as, or could misinterpreted as anything, really. But when you're talking with a guy who stood underneath one so low that he could have hit it with a rock, that was so large he couldn't see the edge in any direction. Uh, we're talking, you know, he said you could have landed a 747 on this thing. Um, and then when it took off, he said had he blinked, he would have thought it just disappeared in place, but it went straight up. At about a, well, actually, about a, at about a 45-degree angle. No air disturbance, no sonic boom, no wind, no noise. It's incredible. I remember from the, the, the press release or the press communication in Washington that there were a number of senior military personnel involved in the communication. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. And, and, and a lot of people would, would value those... And, and with good reason, those testimonies, because you've got, you know, military guys are very nuts and bolts people, you know? They don't speculate. They can tell you what it wasn't, not what it was. And when you have an object, according to military personnel, responsible for the security of nuclear weapons, telling you that an object of unknown origin landed and was inspected and photographed and touched, and symbols on the craft were etched or sketched in their books and their log books, their Air Force log books. I mean, it's a pretty phenomenal story. And we're talking about the Reynolds from Forest Bentwaters case, 1980, December. Um, and, you know, a number of those. And, and 
those might hold more weight to some uh, than others, and it's, it's certainly very, very compelling for myself. But you did ask me what my, you know, my view of one of the more credible witnesses I'd met with, and I'd have to say Ricky Sorrells. I remember, James, I was in, in the UK last year, and uh, my family live not too far from Wrexham in North Wales. And there was an, in, an incredible sighting in Wrexham a number of years ago, and I, and I spoke to people that had seen the, the UFO in question. I want. I was intrigued to ask you about the, the the military evidence about a UFO disarming. It was either disarming a nuclear weapon or a nuclear facility. I can't remember which. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, there's there's a number of cases featured in Out of the Blue. One of which was a, uh, and it wasn't just eyewitness testimony. It was actual filmed evidence from multiple camera angles of an Atlas rocket being launched at Vandenberg Air Force Base circa 1964, where you have this Atlas rocket with a dummy nuclear warhead, tip warhead, um, traveling between 18, uh, sorry, 8 and 14,000 miles an hour, when suddenly this, uh, and I'm just describing to you what was, what was told to me directly by a first-hand witness, this uh, disc-shaped object comes into view, circles around the nuclear tip, the dummy nuclear tipped warhead, and shoots beams at it. And then the tip falls out of the sky. Wow. And there was film footage of that that this gentleman that I interviewed was responsible for capturing. I mean, he was just capturing a launch at Vandenberg. They had absolutely no idea that they were going to capture a disc. And he watched the footage. He, he shot it. And then a couple days later, he was brought in to a meeting unexpectedly. Uh, there was the uh, base commander was there and a number of guys in suits were there and they play, played the film and then they stopped it and said, what the hell is that? And he said, well, it looks to me like we captured a UFO. And there are other cases at Malstrom Air Force Base where you have UFOs spotted, witnessed very low to the ground and, and then all of a sudden a number of the Minutemen missiles go into a no-go situation, which according to the uh, base commander that I spoke to, none of them are connected to each other. So if one was affected, it wouldn't affect the others. But all, most of their missiles went into a no-go right after a flying saucer uh, was witnessed hovering over the installation. Now, keep in mind, the December 1980, unbeknownst to the world, was housing nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And those uh, objects, whatever they were, flying over the base that night and multiple nights afterwards, were seen shooting beams of light down into the bunkers, and those bunkers were housing nuclear weapons. Uh, that was direct. Re that was referred to me directly by the deputy base commander, Colonel Charles Halt, and a number of witnesses that were with him that night. You remember the infamous tape recording? Yes, I do. Yeah. So they seem to have some sort of interest um, in our nuclear capabilities. Yeah, I I often wonder, actually, James, if it's that they, uh, you know. We, I'm very interested in metaphysics, and I believe that everything is interconnected. So I, I often ask myself if extraterrestrials are interested in monitoring our nuclear activities because they potentially carry such enormous consequences and not potentially just for this planet, but for um, many others, and potentially not just for this dimension, but for others. So do you feel that that's why extraterrestrials may be interested in our activities with uh, nuclear fuel and nuclear weapons even? Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because, you know, White Sands, New Mexico, I mean, you've got, what was it, Ground Zero, the detonation of the atomic bomb at Trinity site, and you've got all this UFO activity, the resurgence of UFO activity right around that time, right? I mean, when was it detonated? Was that 45? Approximately, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, Trinity Site 45, you know, so you've got that whole massive wave of UFO sightings starting right around that time. And the epicenter, of course, would be in New Mexico. So it's funny that, is it a coincidence that the whole Roswell thing happened there and that all those sightings happened there? I, I don't know. I doubt it. It seems like there's a preponderance of, of evidence that would suggest there's a keen interest in our nuclear capabilities. And I asked 
a, a, a colonel actually, and this this guy was responsible for making the decision of or actually implementing, pushing the, the finger on the button to ignite, you know, World War Three, basically. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you think was going on that day at Maelstrom? And he said, well, it looks to me like they were taking the hands out of, the matches out of the hands of a baby is exactly what he said. Yes. Yeah. Because of the consequences, it seems that that's something uh, of interest. I often wonder, don't you, that maybe we're so far behind that they're not really interested in, in us. We don't really have a lot to, to offer. But a nuclear event has such consequences, that's something that they may be interested in. It seems to be certainly very plausible to me. I can't say with 100% certainty that that's what's going on, but uh, I also would say that that appears to be the most likely case scenario, is that we're under some sort of surveillance observation, and perhaps that level of activity would affect whatever dimension or wherever they're from. I don't know. Now, James, I want to ask you, were you concerned about your safety or what might happen to you when you were coordinating this press release in Washington. In other words, did you have concerns that you, in effect, were coordinating a number of people that were giving very credible evidence about UFOs and that the authorities, for example, may be very displeased by that? Funny you should say that. You know, out of all the films I've done, all the places I've traveled, there were only two times where I felt uncomfortable. One was when I was investigating the Stevensville, Texas sighting that was involved, uh, that involved a local Air Force base. One of the primary witnesses, one of the key witnesses, this guy Ricky Sorrells, was being at the time, and I witnessed this firsthand, harassed by the local Air Force base. And he basically said, excuse me, he basically said to the Air Force base, stop, this is an armed man living off the beaten path in the country. And, you know, tough guy. I mean, a Texan armed to the gills. And he told the officer, he said, you stop flying your helicopters over my property. And their response was, you stop talking about what you saw. And I witnessed very strange activity, which appears to be that he was being clearly monitored and uh, under surveillance by... I had a really I'd like to give you an example. That, you know, this guy lives way out in the middle of nowhere, and this suddenly this FedEx truck arrives at his house, and the guy says, "Oh, terribly sorry, I got the wrong address." I'm thinking, how the heck did that? And meanwhile, he's been getting phone calls and helicopters flying over his place at night. Since then, there's been an acquisition of his property, uh, and, and I had a very uneasy feeling, and we ended up leaving town. Very uneasy feeling. That was once. That was it. The other time is when I was well. The other time when I was putting together the panel. I got an email that said, stop doing what you're doing, otherwise I'm going to put you to Z. And the Zs got progressively smaller in the email, and I could never find out who sent it. But it might have been just a coincidence, I don't know. But during the actual event, I remember there was a lot of things, obviously, I had to keep track of, documenting, you know, we had, a present, we had the presentation, and we had all the media requests for interviews, and we had a panel, fill, uh, you know, a room filled with these incredible witnesses flown in from all parts of the world. And at one point, I looked around the room, at the ballroom, at the National Press Club, and there were two guys in suits that were filming with very small cameras up top. They weren't down on the floor with everyone else. There was like a little railing above, very narrow, very spot, very unusual place to be. And there were two guys in suits up there. And then I was told later that because remember, these were all military guys that I had flown in. They said, you know, you had the NSA or CIA, NSA, and maybe the DIA were, were present here. So, but they weren't threatening it at all, but they, were, they didn't want to interact with anybody, and they were filming it, perhaps for their own investigation. And, you know, one of the things that I realized during that time in 2007, you know, I, I go primarily by first-hand experiences, in other words, from what's told to me, not what I read out of a book, but what's told to me by the military witness, witnesses, and every single military man that I interviewed, regardless where they were from, whether it was Tehran, Belgium, South America, 
uh, France, wherever, England, within hours of the case, there was a uh, representative from the American government. I don't know what agency they were from. They didn't know what agency they were from investigating the case. And even in one particular time, and they say, oh, we don't investigate UFOs anymore since the termination of Blue Book in 69, which I learned is absolute hogwash. But there, in one particular case, I think it was the 89-1990 over Belgium case when they, with De Brouwer, General De Brouwer of the Air Force, Belgian Air Force, said that, 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 that um, uh, uh, an American from an unknown government agency was there investigating the case and requested for the gun cam footage taken by the F-16s that night that were scrambled to intercept that UFO. And he said, sure, I'll share that with you, provided you give me an official request in writing. Well, the, the guy wouldn't do it. It's fascinating. Have then there would be a, be a paper trail. Now, I, I didn't read about this. This was told to me by the people who experienced it firsthand, from the General uh, uh, Jafari in Tehran, the 1976 UFO over Tehran, case absolutely phenomenal uh people down in south america chile and and brazil peru um belgium france england i mean the deputy base commander colonel charles Holt told me that a lot of his men were interrogated and given sodium pentothal he didn't authorize that who was that what government agency did that they say they're not investigating ufos i mean all i can say to you is my ass yeah. Well, James, wasn't there, a, there was a, a very big and well-publicized sighting in Russia quite recently, even just a couple of months ago, I think. Hmm. So, you know, I get stuff sent to me so often. You lose you have track, to, I'm you sure. You have to remind me of that because I get stuff sent to me so often and, and I don't always have the time to investigate all the current stuff. So you might know more about that than me. Well, it's just simply there was a there was an incredible UFO sighting in Russia, in part of Russia, and school children had seen it. All, all manner of different people had seen this this UFO, and it was very well reported um, in the in the media. But I I always find it just fascinating. And even as a kid, when I was interested in UFOs and would watch TV shows about UFOs and read books about them, I could never quite understand why. There's so much information. So many people have seen UFOs. There's so much evidence, yet there's never really a discussion about how we hold our governments or the, the authorities in our different countries accountable for telling us what's actually going on. Well, it's just that's a very good point. You know, when I went to Russia and interviewed Pavel Popovich, cosmonaut Pavel Popovich, I went and interviewed General Alex Zave in Star City in the 90s. When I first got there, we met with this, none of the, actually, no, none of them did speak English, actually. Maybe Pavel Popovich, but I didn't speak English with him. But the first thing our translator said to us on day one, and he was translating from an admiral, actually, and they, he said, if you're here to discuss whether or not, this is in Russian, if you're here to discuss whether or not UFOs are real, the door's right over there. You can leave now. And I sort of looked at the translator and I said, well, what is he, you know? And what he was saying to me was, you clearly haven't done your homework if you're here to find out whether they exist or don't exist. We're here to meet with you because we'd like to encourage to open up a dialogue, an exchange of information internationally, with, especially with the, with the U.S. government. And it seems very compartmentalized, but, you know, you have to remember there was a very... A uh, big incident that happened in 52, I think it was July of 52, over the Capitol building in the U.S. And uh, it was witnessed by a lot of people. There were, I think, F-86s scrambled to intercept these things. They were picked up on radar. They had visual confirmation. It was a big deal. And they had a press conference, and General John Sanford came out, in, you know, in uniform and addressed the nation about it. And quietly behind the scenes is when they put together the Robertson panel. And that was in 53. Dr. Jalen Hynek was part of that. And the Robertson panel said, I, you know, according to what people that I've interviewed that knew of it, we can't necessarily, de de excuse me, we can't necessarily deny their existence, but we can ridicule those who claim to have seen them. 
And that policy was adopted in like right around that time, and it stuck. And it was very effective. So, you know, people didn't want to come forward for fear of ridicule and laughter. And why is it that we have this knee-jerk response within all of us, myself included, back years ago? Uh, if someone sees something inexplicable in the night sky, what's funny about that? Would you say, James, that the Russian authorities are most open about this? Or is there a country that stands out to you as a as a country that's particularly whose authorities are particularly open about the existence of UFOs? Russian authorities, French authorities, Belgian authorities, people in South America. I interviewed a general, Jose Carlos Pereira, Brazilian Air Force. He was very um, tight-lipped on specific cases, but he mentioned a few, which basically said that UFOs, can, you know, uh, UFOs are real. The Belgians seem to be much more open with it, much more. I'm just talking my personal experience. I interviewed someone at CNES, which is the French equivalent of NASA, Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales, with a guy named Jacques Patnay, who was a current employee of CNES. And they had a wing, that, a branch, I think Japon, Japon, that investigated UFOs on an official, in an official capacity, who admitted to me on camera that, that we were probably being visited. Very big statement for someone in his position. Um, the Russians were rather very open with me at the time. Uh, so it seems that, you know, and I, when I say open, open, not excluding that UFOs are real, not saying definitively, hey, you know, we're, we're not definitive statements that we're being visited, but alluding as an extremely strong possibility that's what's happening. But the American government, pfft, nothing, man. They are tight lipped and not releasing anything and just denial, denial, denial. Do you think perhaps they had more to hide than the rest? I don't yeah. know. You know, there's, there's there's so much, isn't there, in the public domain about the development of technology that that we've we've developed incredible technology because of our reverse engineering, our our research on UFO findings such as Roswell, New Mexico. Well, I'd like to think that's what they did. And it would certainly um, it would certainly be the right, I mean, okay, let's back up. If the accounts are to be believed that we actually recovered one of these things back in 47, I personally happen to believe that we did. But that's just my belief. I can't prove it. I can prove that there are structured craft of unknown origin whizzing around with impunity in our airspace that don't seem to have any visible means, propulsion, wings, tail, making any sound, 90 degree angle turns at high speed. That I feel I could prove in a court of law to any jury. The Roswell, in my personal view, happened. I'd like to think they took that debris and dissected it and reverse engineered it, some little secret base underground somewhere, which very likely that's what happened, but I can't prove that. It, there's a lots of evidence to suggest that's what did happen. Whether or not they were successful at reverse engineering all of it or not uh, is unknown to me. I'd like to think that they did, and it's, you know, hopefully not all being used for, <laughs> for weaponry. <laughs> you know, I'd, if there was a propulsion plant that would wean us off of fossil fuels and they're hold, withholding that from the, from the world, that would make me very, uh, very angry. Well, I've heard this recently. I, I can't remember where I heard that. Oh, gosh, I wish I could remember, but there was something in the... Uh, oh, actually, no, I know what it is. Well, we're going to have a show about this, James. I'll let you know when we have this show. I was speaking with a potential guest for the radio show who told me about somebody else in California who uh, says that we have been given clean energy technology but that it is being will withheld from the public domain. So it wasn't Dr. Stephen Greer talking about it, was it? Sorry? Was it Dr. Stephen Greer talking about yes, that? Yes, yes. That's the mm -hmm. name I was given, absolutely. Yeah, well, he's been talking about that for a while. I haven't seen it yet. Well, we're hopefully going to have him as a guest.
Hey, I, I would love nothing more than to know that was true. But at this point, as far as I can tell, it's, it's all speculative. I've been hearing Dr. Greer talk about zero point energy and these, these devices for quite some time. Not to say they exist or don't exist. I'd love it if they did exist, but I'd love to see the evidence for them. Well, Will, when we do get him on the show, I'll let you know. Uh, okay. Because, yeah, you could maybe give me <laughs> some right, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to sound stuff. like, uh, I, you know, d uh, incredulous to the idea at all. I just, I haven't seen enough evidence yet. But I, believe me, I would be, uh, I would love that to be true. And if it was, I'd do everything in my power to get the word out. But at this point, it's merely speculative, and it's third party. I haven't seen one operating. I haven't seen one generating electricity from zero. Have you? Not recently. <laughs> no, not at no, all. I, I know. I've, I've heard talk about I'm these interested things. to interview him. It should be interesting to ask him some of these questions. I, I want to ask you, James, as well about abductions, because so often we talk about UFO sightings, but also we hear stories of people who claim to have been abducted, uh, even from childhood on numerous occasions, who people say that they've had uh, chips implanted in their their bodies have you done research on abductions as well no i've investigated a few cases of hold on let me just make sure i shut this thing off here before it vibrates um i've investigated personally a few cases like the travis walton case the betty and barney hill case the allagash uh, uh allagash four in the 70s um, that I feel are extremely multi-eyewitness testimony um, cases. I mean, the Travis Walton case in Snowflake, Arizona, in my view, is one of the best, you know, just because there were so many witnesses to that, to that event. Um, so, and I, you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope. It's like you have a phenomenon. It's clearly physical it's clearly under intelligent control, then clearly there must be obviously an intelligence behind it, therefore, therefore occupants. Um, but it's a slippery slope. When you start talking about, uh, you know, implants and, and babies floating in incubators and all this stuff, those accounts, some of those accounts might very well be true, but we have to be careful uh, as people who research and, and, um, and make films on this topic not to attach themselves firmly to any one particular case for the fear that that could discredit all of the work we're doing. However, there's a few cases I feel that, you know, one can. But you, you understand my point here. There's some pretty wild um, allegations. Yes, and you've got to keep your work credible. So it's got to be I think back to credible. Evidence, I think absolutely. more importantly, right now is to take it in baby steps um, and establish beyond a reasonable doubt that these things are real. They're happening. The phenomenon's occurring worldwide. Uh, it's clearly under intelligent control. Uh, therefore, there's an intelligence behind it. There are occupants. Do I think some of these might be remotely remotely controlled? Sure. Do I think some of them are occupied? Yes. Um, do I believe in abductions across the board? I would say there's more evidence to suggest they're happening than not happening, but I can't prove them right now. I don't have that bit of proof. Um, but I can't also at the same time, you know, speak intelligently like, you know, Bud Hopkins or Dr. John Mack or um, any of these other researchers, David Jacobs, uh, which I totally respect their work and what they've done. I just can't speak intelligently on it. Well, you've certainly got lots to share, James. It's fascinating to talk with you. We're going to take a short commercial break, James, and then my colleague Maureen wants to ask you a question. So we'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Bye. A new era in psychic services has begun. Psychicaccess.com. You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified, and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. 
our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at psychicaccess.com. Well, welcome back, James. Maureen has a question for you, so I'm going to invite Maureen to join us for a moment in, and put her question forward. Maureen, go ahead. Are you an astrotra... No, no, I'm just joking. Yeah, right. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> confirm nor deny, Maureen. <laughs> no, you know, I, I, I wanted to ask you about, you know, I, I know that you're very credible, very educated, and you, you know you're, you know what you know. And I wanted to know if you had had any information or if you've heard of information in Las Vegas, Nevada during the 60s. The reason I'm asking is because I had a – I was born there. No one's born there, but I was. <laughs> oh. And I it was 1963, and I know that there's – it seems like there's a lot of the – all I, like I said, it's not about what I believe. I do know there's other things going on and whatever. It's not me or, <laughs> or entity, whatever other beings that are around or have been or checked in on us. And I had an experience when I was three years old when I lived there. And and it was funny because it was like just a light, like a green teal. It was like a, I remember it was like a blue green teal. I remember very, very, I mean, so clearly when I was three. And it came into the windows you know, we had the old crank windows that you know you cranked them open yep and and it was like these this light and it kind of bounced in it wasn't like a big explosion and it was bouncing around and then it kind of left and then you know fast forward when i was in my early well late 20s um uh, the same light i saw again that was but it wasn't like i was driving you know and saw this huge light like you know hear about a lot of people but mine was a little bit different than that and i and I and I and I did thought you know I, I thought well you know my brothers are playing tricks but my brother nobody was there you know there was a lot of kids and family they weren't there, and I always felt something very interesting about that time period in Vegas so I was just wondering you know if you've heard what your your thoughts are for the little things like the little lights that might pop around <laughs> you know do you follow well, me well you know it's funny actually because one of uh, a very good family friend who's a pilot. Uh, he's about 20 years older than me, and he was piloting a single-engine airplane over Europe at about 2.30 in the morning, and Heligoland was what he was flying over there. I'm not sure exactly where that is, to the north. But he described this orb that initially he was going to take evasive maneuver because he, the, his dashboard lit up red. And he thought, boy, another plane is coming in, and I better look at its position and take the appropriate action. And he looked forward, and there, just above, well, it appeared to be, he had to squint, and it, and it filled the cockpit with red light, was this orb. And it was tracking him. And it stayed with him probably for about 10 seconds. And then he said it accelerated at a phenomenal rate of speed, just straight ahead of the aircraft, did an extremely sharp angle turn and went straight up into the sky, into the stars, and was gone. And it was an orb. And I've heard lots of those stories of orbs tracking. I've heard people in all different shapes and sizes. Um, so those maybe those are remote. Ah, gosh, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah, have yeah. to speculate, but let's just put it this way. I've heard those stories from civilians, pilots, uh, and military officials for decades. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you for that because, like I, it, or I should have said, or I guess is the best way of putting it exactly. And um, thank you. I yeah, no, I, I, you know, I wish I could sit there and tell you what they are. I don't know. I just heard. No, I, I know what they are. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I had a trip. Thank you very much. James. Of course. Thank you, Maureen. James, I, we want to ask you as well if you've had a frightening experience with a UFO. Well, I don't usually talk about this very often because I don't want it to... Um, I, I want... I don't, I don't want it to interfere with, with my work or 
people's interpretation of my ability to to cloud my judgment or to influence my way of thinking with the phenomenon because all it did was trigger for me an interest and when i was 19 i was lying in bed about midnight with a girlfriend her name was lisa reinhardt in northern california and we looked out the window the bedroom window and just above the trees was this orb and it was probably like a yellowy orange color but it was kind of like pulsating a little bit almost like it was um like it was breathing or pulsating just a little bit it was changing and my girlfriend lisa looked at me at the time and she said what the hell is that and i said i don't know what that is but whatever it is I get the feeling it knows we're looking at it. And she said, I have the same feeling. Close the blinds, I'm freaked out. So I jumped out of bed in my underwear and I was fumbling around trying to shut the blinds and they ripped, I ripped them right off the wall. In my haste, I pulled them right down off the wall and they hit the floor and there I was fumbling around in my underwear at midnight trying to put the damn blinds back up again to close, you know, to obscure our view of this thing. <clears throat> and I finally got the blinds closed and we're there clutching each other and I don't know, a couple of minutes went by, and she said, I wonder if it's still there. And I opened the blinds, and it was gone. Incredible. I have a wonderful friend in in Tennessee here, Doris. Uh, she's been so good to me, and I'm very good friends with her daughter, Misty. And Doris was telling me that she remembers as a child in South Carolina, she went out for a walk with her mother and her sister, I think, and they were out in the countryside and this enormous disc UFO moved in and just stopped above them. And she, she said it was just gigantic. And immediately their mother grabbed their hands and said, we have to go back to the house. And they just ran back to the house and shut themselves in the house. But I, I know Doris very well and she, she wouldn't tell me a, a porky pie, as we say in the UK, a lie. She, it was a, a true account. Oh my gosh, I've heard so many accounts. I have a guy one time that I was trying to get in out of the blue, and, and my old next door neighbor, uh, her name was Colleen, and she said my ex boyfriend had an incredible UFO encounter. You should talk to him. Long story short, I get in touch with this guy, and he lives in Texas. And he said, "I'm not interested. Sorry." I'm, I'm not interested in coming on camera at all. And I, he said, but if you like, I'll tell you the story, just between the two of us. I said, please, I'd love to hear it. I always love these bits, because why on earth would anyone tell me I don't have any interest in going public with my signing, but if you'd like to know on a personal level, I'll tell you what happened. And he said that they were having a barbecue about four in the afternoon, and that the neighbors were out. It was a lovely summer, some, uh, summer afternoon, and... The neighbors were, everyone was sort of out in their, in their yards. And this object, about the size of two or three football fields, was hovering, just appeared hovering right, you know, within stone's reach. And he said you could see the silhouettes through the windows of, of beans. That's what he told me. And all the neighbors were looking at it, just astounded by this thing. And then it, you know, as people say, they left the area at extremely high rates. People does it. But he said you could actually see an outline of the, of the beans on this. I, you know, I've heard countless stories of that. Almost like they were just having a, just having a look. Do, when Imagine do how you life feel, changing that would James, be. I know this is a difficult question, but do you feel that there will be a point in time when governments will come clean about UFOs? Well, I've been having this conversation. We're launching a project. Your listeners can go and check it out. Sorry, someone keeps trying to call me and I'm ignoring it. But I'm launching a project called 701. And I'm working with a gentleman named Tracy Torme. Uh, he worked on contact intruders. He wrote Fire in the Sky. And Tracy and I have been talking about that, bringing up that very question. We're thinking, like, how could we get, how could we create a film that wouldn't necessarily point the finger of blame at the government and hold um, their position against them, but to make allowances for their position somewhat as being justified, certainly back then, 
and that they don't know much more other than that, that they are real um, today than they did when they set out to investigate this back in the 40s. Maybe they're just as, of course, they have more concrete evidence, but may, just maybe they're just as much of the dark about this as your average Joe, other than they know they're real. They know they're we're being visited. They know they're technological. They know these things, but they don't have the answers. Maybe they set out legitimately and tried to get the explanations. I know there was a, an internal struggle going on in the Air Force for disclosure back in the 40s and early 50s. There were some people who believed that the public had a right to know. There were others that were saying, look, let's, this is going to open up a can of worms and we need to provide some answers of which we don't have right now. Maybe it was legitimately, you know, debated at the time and they decided that, you know, right now is not a good time to disclose what we know and what we don't know. So perhaps, you know, Tracy and I have been talking about this position, taking this position and allowing a platform that would minimize the egg all over their face and, and, and opening up a dialogue and, and an invitation to um, disclose what's really happening. And we feel that if we take this position, and it very well might be true, I don't know, that would at least um, in highly increase the probability of something like that happening, at the very least increase the probability of people like uh, Fife Symington and John Podesta, former White House Chief of Staff, and possibly Clinton and others, to participate. And so that's the position that we want to take with this new film project because perhaps if it's done right, um, they could come out and get this monkey off their back. Wow, so you feel that Clinton, for example, may even comment? Uh, you know, I don't think Clinton knows a whole lot other than that he was given the runaround. But, you know, keep in mind, I've talked to people at Luke Air Force Base in, out of Phoenix, Arizona, during the 1997 Phoenix Lights case. Remember, he was president. And according to them... I don't know this to be factual, but according to what they told me, we went to a DEFCOM 2 or 3 alert, which is kind of like, you know, you got to notify the president. Um, there was that. There was the 50th anniversary of Roswell during his presidency. There was a book written called Friends in I Places by Webb Hubble, where he talks about Clinton wanting answers on UFOs and being very serious about it. So we're pretty well, and we know that, that Lawrence Rockefeller briefed Clinton. I actually have the briefing document that was provided to, to the Clinton administration by Lawrence Rockefeller. It features a lot of the pieces that we have, and I know what I saw, actually. So I know that there were inquiries made. I know that, there, that he was seriously making inquiries, um, and he quite possibly could have been notified in the 1997 Phoenix case. So there are some things that he knows, probably a lot more than he doesn't. But if our approach is done respectfully, carefully, he might consider coming on board. Wow. Wow. So do you feel that generally the president doesn't really know the full story anyway? Definitely not. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. Well, Brenda wants to ask you a question now, James, as well. So I'm going to invite Brenda to speak up and give you her question. Okay. Hi, James. Um, it's absolutely fascinating, and I I saw UFO myself in the 70s at Mount, at Mount, Mount Pal Palomar, and it was very similar to a lot of the kind of accounts that people have been talking about. This huge, it was an oval object with lots of lights on the un underneath it, and it kind of hovered for a minute, then took off. Not even a minute, a few seconds. But... Um, what I wanted to ask was, um, you know, there's all this ancient alien stuff on, you know, all over television now and stuff. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, they've been around forever. And do you believe that, and this is kind of where I see it, you know, in the advent of man-made religion, a lot of this has been kind of stuffed down, like, oh, God, this can't be, you know, maybe it's counter contradictive to, you know, certain religious views. Well, didn't God create the earth 5,000 years ago? Yes, but um, 
In the ancient, Sorry, well, you know, well, you know what I'm talking about. The ancient Egyptians, the Mayans, and all this, you know, the, the stuff they talk about in ancient aliens and stuff. And they, I, you know. I, I was walking around in Tikal in the 1996. I was with an archaeologist, and he found out that I was re- interested in UFOs, and there was this old Stella that had fallen over in the middle of the forest. And a lot of the stuff, a lot of the Mayan ruins at that time were were still covered in rainforest and he pointed out this old stella this had fallen a stone carved stone had fallen over mm-hmm. and on it was i took a photograph of it at the time actually i have it somewhere i should find that photograph was what appeared to be a person at the controls of a flying object so i said what's that and he looked at me and said I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I mean, why, why would it be a new thing? I mean, I, why would it be a new thing? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Have you heard of the, what they've talked about at Saqqara in Egypt, that there's a UFO landing pad there? Yeah, well, when I was, I was hiking around in, uh, not to call, sorry, I'll think of it, Chichen Itza. There's oh, a, Chichen Itza is amazing. Yeah, there's a four-sided pyramid. Um, mm-hmm. Thinking of the name here, but it was Kuku Khan was the god that they created it for, and he wasn't like this mystical character, according to the Mayans. He was this uh, feathered serpent that descended from the heavens and landed, and they dedicated this four-sided pyramid to him. And uh, Cuckoo Khan, I believe it was. And Kukla it's called El, Cast- El Castillo Kukla. is the name of the pyramid. But, you know, it was very interesting reading that when I was down there. And when I was walking, and I got, I, fortunately, I, I actually, we, we actually rented out, I was with National Geographic at the time. It was one of, one of the few good things that came from my TV show, Chasing UFOs. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got to walk around and teach and eat, so we got to rent the whole place out at night. To it's ourselves, mysterious. Un- Boy, that must have been freaky, especially in those older pyramids in the back. Oh, my gosh. I went up Cuckoo Khan. I went up El Castillo all by myself at night. Mm. It well, was, you, you were in a brave field of work. And I had a little flashlight. And it's, I don't know if you've walked up there. You can't walk up it anymore. They closed it off to the public. But I got to walk up it by myself at night. It was something wow. else. But it it's looked really like steep. A, it's extremely it steep. It looked like a, if I was going to make a landing pad for somebody, that's what I would have done. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, well. <laughs> well, James, I'm so sorry, but we're, I could talk to you forever. It's been so interesting, but we're we're out of time, unfortunately. Well, listen. I hope that uh, you know you guys. En- I certainly enjoyed it. And if yes. anyone wants to check out our new project, we are. Um, it's 701 the movie 701 the movie.com we're offering a very large reward for ufo evidence it could be a document could be film footage could be a photograph hopefully it's official but it could be civilian um there's a little form that you could fill out and people could submit it and the uh award in the very near future there will be an announcement made that the reward is going up significantly but for the time being it's a hundred thousand but in the near future it's going to go up even higher so if anyone out there has evidence or knows someone who has some evidence that'd like to submit it's not a blurry ambiguous orb with no points of reference in the night sky uh something structured preferably with points of reference we'll take nighttime but we're preferred daytime uh please consider submitting that evidence Wonderful. Well, thank you, James. Just tell us again. That's tell us the name of the website again, just so that everybody gets that again. The number seven zero one themovie dot com. It stands for the number of cases not explained as part of Project Blue Book's files. There Great. were twelve thousand six hundred and eighteen cases investigated, out of which seven hundred one remain unexplained. Fantastic. Well, James, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for doing this pioneering work as well. Oh, gosh. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure, James. Good luck for the future. We'll be be following you. Hello. My name is Res Miranda. 
If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic Access, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. PsychicAccess.com These very unambiguous encounters, and some of which dealt with evidence and the disappearance of evidence, some very good evidence, might I add. So uh, my father was on my team from that moment onward. Well, that's fantastic, James. James, I have to ask you, of all the people you must have interviewed and worked with in the production of these films, who would you say is the most credible source confirming that US UFOs do exist? That's a very good question. And I have two answers to that question. One would be my personal. Like, you know, there are times during your journey where you... You have an affirmation that's just so palpable that you, it's, it's, it's very, it very, it deeply affects you. And I would have to say for that person, my personal view, now this wouldn't be necessarily shared among the UFO community or perhaps anybody else, but there was a meeting with a gentleman in Texas in 2008 named Ricky Sorrells. He was a deer hunter and he was a very religious man. His family was religious. And he had this experience that, quite, that forced him to question the very nature of his religion, where he stood under this craft. He said it was so quiet, he wouldn't have known it was there had he not looked up. And he looked up with his rifle in hand, and it was dusk. And he's a metal worker. And he looked up and he saw this object so large that he couldn't see the edge in any direction. And he could study the metal. It was just above the treetops. And he I'm interested in UFOs. Well, thank you for that spectacular introduction. I need to meet this guy. He sounds amazing. <laughs> you're it. <laughs> if you're British, you're, you're good here, James. We, well, I think you're fabulous. <laughs> no, I do appreciate that. It's nice that someone's listening. <laughs> but, but, um, I was, funny enough, I had a father who was very mainstream. He worked for everything from Sports Illustrated, Playboy, Car and Driver, um, some tech magazines. We met with Stephen Hawking at Gainville, Gondol and Keys, and race car drivers. And I, funny enough, had a little bit of a sighting. Now, my sighting doesn't have anything to do with my current views on the subject matter. However, it certainly triggered an interest. And um, I found that the further I dug, the more I found. The more I found, the further I wanted to keep digging. And what I soon discovered was there was a lot more to UFOs than swamp gas and weather balloons. Um, my father was extremely concerned about the path I was taking. He kept saying, look, son, there's nothing to it. It's a big waste of time. Whatever you do, please don't go down this path. It's a, it's a dead-end street. And I think that fueled me even further. I'll prove him wrong, you know, sort of thing. And uh, four years later, I produced and sold a film called UFOs, 50 Years of Denial, back in 1997. Looked at the metal, and he was trying to describe the metal unlike anything he'd ever seen before. No rivets, no seams, no weld marks. And he was trying, to, he was looking at the belly of this, air, of this craft that was silently hovering just above him. And he, at one point, took his rifle and looked through the scope and aimed it at it and was actually considering pulling the trigger just to see what sort of, how it would, if it would ping off the metal or what it would do. And then he thought to himself, perhaps this isn't such a good idea. Maybe I shouldn't. But meeting with this man because he didn't want to go on camera. He didn't want to go public with what he'd experienced. He was having a really difficult time with it, with his religion. He was having a really difficult time with it, with his family. And um, he wished the whole experience had never happened, but it did. And it took me three months to finally get him comfortable enough to go on camera. And that for me, 
speaks volumes because he's not looking for publicity. He's not looking for any financial rewards. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. And when you meet with people like that, you know, and the thing is with UFOs, a lot of times people always associate some sort of ambiguous light off in the distance that could be interpreted as, or could misinterpret it as anything, really. But when you're talking with a guy who stood underneath one so low that he could have hit it with a rock, that was so large he couldn't see the edge in any direction. Uh, we're talking, you know, he said you could have landed a 747 on this thing. Um, and then when it took off, he said had he blinked, he would have thought it just disappeared in place, but it went straight up. At about a, well, actually, about a, at about a 45 degree angle. I'll tell you a little bit about our guest, James Fox. He was born in England, good man, and raised in America by his father, Charles Fox, who wrote for newspapers and magazines like Rolling Stone, Playboy, Harper's, and the Catholic Digest. And when James was just three years old, his father was struck with multiple sclerosis. For many years, James assisted his father as he traveled to locations for new stories. And they conducted interviews with people ranging from theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking for Esquire to race car driver Dan Gurney for Car and Driver. Now, for nearly 20 years, James has traveled across the world in pursuit of the truth about UFOs. <laughs> are, you, are you with us there, James? I am. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. I was just I was I was just going through an introduction, James, telling everybody about your experience. Now, before I ask you some questions, I wanted to just say to our listeners that you've produced three films about UFOs, and in 2007 orchestrated an event with help from journalist Leslie Keane from the Coalition for Freedom of Information, which is hailed as the most credible civilian effort of disclosure on UFOs in history. And I'm very excited because although I wasn't meant to be interviewing you this evening, uh, Bobby was, I'm excited to have this opportunity because I remember watching that, uh, that event and being fascinated by the, the credibility, uh, the, the, the evidence from these people that were involved in that announcement. So, James, welcome to the show. My first question for you has to be, when did you first become wow? And what was the reaction to that, James? Well, you know, it's a good little film. I mean, by today's standards, it doesn't really, I don't know, I stand the test of time. I, but overall, you know, we had, a, we had an astronaut and we had some high-ranking military officers. Uh, and and I think people were were stunned, uh, were were certainly impressed, um, and the fact that I did it I think really surprised more people than anything else. And it it um, I never had any intentions on doing any further UFO related stuff after completion of that film. I mean you know four years on a project really takes the wind out of yourselves, and um, we could get into this further, but basically through a series of invitations and just complete off-the-wall uh, events, I was led into producing Out of the Blue. And how was the reaction to that? Uh, that was, uh, well, funny because I took my father during production of Out of the Blue to an interview with a gentleman named Gordon Cooper. He was a Mercury astronaut, one of the last American astronauts to go up in space alone. And he was an iconic figure of my dad's generation. And after that interview, my father was pretty much convinced that I was on the right path. Because he said to himself, why on earth would this man with everything to lose and nothing to gain, not asking for any money or any financial uh, you know, gain at all, do this? Why would he talk about